Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Ophthalmology and ENT. I'm Nick Hetson Paul. This is the internal medicine review course, and let's just jump right in. Now, for many of you, ophthalmology is really a lot of this. Red eyes, red eyes, and the eye of Sauron. That's all you think it is. The eyes are red, put some drops on it. The eyes are red, put some drops on it. But ophthalmology on the American Board of Internal Medicine exam is a great deal more. And it's an area that you're not comfortable with. Because on the wards, for the last three years of your residency, what have you done when somebody had a problem with their eyes? Call a consult. They show up later. Call a consult. They take too long to show up. Call a consult. We don't want to deal with the eyes. But as they say, the eyes are a window to your soul. And on the exam, they're a window to getting a lot of good points. And what you don't realize is that the eye is just a big bag of water with different pathways and tubes and connections and blood vessels and retina and nerves. And when it moves, it jiggles a little bit. This is the eye movement in slow motion, just to give you an idea of just how gelatinous it really is and how also easy it is for it to get infected. So our first question is here. You see this person's eye, and what you notice is that the sclera is normal, the iris and the entire eye itself is fine but the tissue surrounding the eye is inflamed, especially the upper eyelid. This is called blepharitis. This is an inflammation of that area. And the most common cause of blepharitis, meaning the most common organism to cause blepharitis is Staph aureus. If they ask you on the exam, okay, you know it's Staph aureus, because remember most skin itises are due to Staph. Earlobe itis, nose itis, anything itis, cellulitis, Staph and strep, but remember, strep is only most common five times. Lymphangitis, impetigo, which is now 50-50 staph and strep, necrotizing fasciitis, erysipelas, and scarlet fever. Those five things, L-I-N-E-S, lines, lymphangitis, impetigo, necrotizing fasciitis, erysipelas, and scarlet fever, are most commonly strep. And impetigo is kind of this area where we're not sure, but that mnemonic still holds true. The best treatment for blepharitis, number one, you tell the patient to apply a warm compress, and then lastly, if needed, topical antibiotics. Here we have another image. Now, this is an image that the actual ophthalmologist will show you. Remember, a lot of these are either slit lamp exams or retinal exams, and that's a lot of what the ABIM will give you. They will actually show you these images, and you have to know them. I know you might be thinking, well, listen, for all these years, during my residency, I don't even know what an ophthalmoscope looks like. And I know all of you are sitting back at home right now thinking, man, you gotta be crazy. I don't even own an ophthalmoscope. That's okay. That's why you're taking MedQuest and that's why you're here today. Our team, who is fantastic at all kinds of things that are multimedia, has brought you these images. And so what you're seeing here is a slit lamp exam. This slit exam for someone who has uveitis has a very specific finding. Now what you'll notice, and I'm gonna point it out to you right here, is you see this sort of like, hazy, dusty quality, almost looks like snow in the anterior chamber. Those are called flare cells. The finding that you need to know for uveitis is flare cells in the anterior chamber. And what I like to point out to you is what flare cells remind me of is like snow falling in a snow globe. What you can see here is the snow globe right there. And so if this was the eye, those sort of snowfalls, beautiful, somewhere in Hogsmeade, right before you go to Hogs Wart, who knows? All of those things, all of those things are what would be called flare cells. And that is the finding, flare cells. Now here we have another image. Now you're gonna notice that this section is very multimedia heavy. And what I would suggest is that after you've watched this video clip, you take some time and you go back and just cycle through the pictures, understanding. Also remember, in your compendium document, the pictures are there as well. Now the most common form of uveitis, we know that in the anterior chamber you're gonna see flare cells, but here you notice that the iritis is seen, there's increased redness around the outer ring of the iris, but also the most common form of uveitis, which is not quite iritis, is anterior uveitis. And in this person, this image, you notice there's both anterior uveitis as well as iritis. Now we get to our first case. Our first case is basically a 76-year-old male who presents with difficulty reading for the last six months. He recently started using reading glasses. 
On a fundoscopic exam, there was actually cupping seen at the optic disc as seen on this image. And what you'll notice is that this is the cupping right there. You notice how it's inflamed. It almost looks like the edges are heaped up. If you had to pick one specific clue from this paragraph, the one thing you have to know is cupping at the optic disc margin. Cupping at the optic disc margin. And the first question they're going to ask you is what is the most likely diagnosis? And then what is the test going to be? And then lastly, what is the therapy? For each of these scenarios, each of these cases, you have to know test, diagnosis, and therapy. Well, the correct answer is when you have optic disc cupping, it's open ankle glaucoma. And that describes a hollowed out appearance of the optic nerve or the disc specifically on fundoscopy. Tonometry alone is not enough to diagnose it. A lot of you think just send them off for a tonometric screening, but it's not enough. You have to also combine that with visual field testing. Together, both together, their sensitivity and specificity are high enough to actually confirm glaucoma. Now, the therapy. You gotta bring the pressure down because in glaucoma, the eye's pressure is too high. It's causing cupping of the actual neuronal tissue and difficulty with seeing. So you gotta lower the pressure by two major kinds of medications. And lowering the pressure has actually been shown to reduce the risk of progression of visual field loss and optic disc changes that are long-term in management and in, in terms of outcome. The first is latanoprost, which increases aqueous outflow and the second, which are beta blockers, which decrease aqueous production. So latanoprost increases the outflow and beta blockers reduce the production of all that fluid. And so the pressure in the eye will go down. If that doesn't work, then laser therapy is second line treatment. And that of course creates a pathway that increases aqueous outflow. Lastly, surgical therapy is only for refractory cases. What that means is that if someone fails medical therapy, someone fails laser therapy, which is very, very rare. This specific subset where they need surgical therapy is not as common. For those patients who are refractory cases, what we do is we create a filtration bleb to allow aqueous humor to leave the eye through an alternative route. In other words, if you've got a dam that's overflowing, Remember the Superman cartoons, he comes in and creates a little pathway out there. That's essentially what surgical therapy is. Now case two, case two, you look at this eye and a lot of you right now are sitting at home and you're thinking to yourself, I can't look at these images. My eyes are tearing up. I'm getting itchy. I know you have psychogenic ophthalmoplegias. I know a lot of you are having all kinds of issues in your eyes when you see this kind of thing. It's the same thing that happens when a person comes to clinic and they have scabies. They're itchy and suddenly you become itchy. Your eyes are only doing this because you're seeing someone else's eyes do this. Who knows why it happens? Maybe it's evolutionary. Maybe it's just you're weird. I don't know. But this case is a 72 year old who has severe onset of right eye pain and decreased vision in the right eye. He has a severe headache. Now notice decreased vision, pain and headache. He looks at lights and he has halos around them. This is not Beyonce's halo. This is not due to digoxin because they tell you he does not take digoxin. So now he's got halos around lights. He's not Beyonce. He's not seeing angels and he's not taking digoxin. Why does he have halos? On an eye exam, there's conjunctival redness and edema. The right pupil itself, which is also the one that's pained and having decreased vision is also sluggish to light. The most likely diagnosis, the next step in management are the questions they want to ask you. The most likely diagnosis and the next step in management is what you need to know for somebody with this scenario. And the combination of a painful red eye with decreased vision, corneal edema, and a shallow anterior chamber are the findings of note seen in angle closure glaucoma. And the correct answer here is called gonioscopy, which is the most accurate test for diagnosing angle closure glaucoma our colleagues in ophthalmology will help us with this. The next step in management for angle closure glaucoma is topical pressure lowering eye drops combined with systemic acetazolamide. The combination that's most commonly used are things like timolol or pilocarpine. Now here's what you need to know. And this is how the management is. The intraocular pressure, once you put those eye drops in, those medical treatments should be checked after 60 minutes. And if that medical treatment is successful, then you still go on to laser peripheral iridotomy as the next most appropriate therapy. 
The eye drops break the acute problem. The peripheral erotomy then makes sure that it stays low. If, however, the angle is not opened after both giving eye drops and burning a hole through someone's eye, then surgical peripheral iridotomy is the ultimate therapy. Remember, it's not give some eye drops, I'll see you on Monday. It's give some eye drops, it's improving, blast them with a the laser. Now this is a pretty image. It looks like something out of, I don't know, Van Gogh or Starry Nights. Not quite. That is a retinal image of a 71-year-old healthy male who presents to the emergency department, not to erectile dysfunction, emergency department, with gradual loss of vision in his right eye. Over the last 24 hours, he has had decreased visual acuity in the right eye, his vision has a bluish hue, and he can see normally out of the left eye, but his right eye, he sees everything that's blue. The whole world is blue to him. What is the most likely diagnosis, and what is the best therapy? Well, central retinal vein occlusion occurs for unknown reasons, and it actually leads to blood flow outflow compromise. That pressure then builds up in the capillaries and then subsequently hemorrhage and leakage of fluid and blood into the retinal area. So think about it. Artery comes, capillary bed, vein. If the vein is occluded, pressure backs up. It's like the Long Island Expressway or someplace in Los Angeles where there's traffic everywhere. Accident occurs, everything backs up, bedlam. This gives the fundoscopic image of flame hemorrhages. Those flame hemorrhages are just capillaries exploding all over the place, and so that is why they call them flame hemorrhages. It's a beautiful picture, not so good for the patient. Angiography is the most accurate test, but remember, it is not needed because the clinical exam of the eye is the best thing to tell us. It is only done if that clinical exam is equivocal. Now the treatment involves the acute administration of dexamethasone for the actual macular edema, followed by laser photocoagulation and ranbizumab to prevent neovascularization. Now, our next patient is actually 90 years old, and you can see that she has this pale-looking, pale-looking retina. She's 90, she has atrial fibrillation, she presents with persistent, painless loss of vision, and she tells you, hey, I have no vision in that eye at all. What is happening to me, doc? What's my diagnosis? And by the way, she's 90 and she tells you, what is your next step in management? Can you imagine if a patient says to you, well, I know you know the diagnosis, what is your next step in management? And she's 90, I would fall over laughing. The answer here when somebody has painless visual loss that is complete and you notice a pale retina and there's also a cherry red spot. For those of you who are wondering where the cherry red spot is, right there, right here, cherry red spot. That is consistent with central retinal artery occlusion. Common risk factor is atrial fibrillation. Tiny clot, bing, flies out the heart, goes up into the artery. Intra-arterial thrombolytic therapy is done to establish reperfusion in central retinal artery occlusion. Ocular massage causes actually an increased aqueous outflow through the increased pressure and actually may dislodge the embolism and can be used before somebody's given thrombolytics. But remember, it does not take the place of thrombolytics. Anterior chamber paracentesis, which actually takes a needle, shoves it in the eye, pulls out some fluid to drop the pressure, hoping the clot will actually fly away, is also another potential thing that can be done. But remember, in this day and age, with directed thrombolysis, that is the first line therapy. Also, if you tell your patient, now you can't see in your right eye, it's a good thing, because I'm about to stick a needle in it, they kind of freak out regardless. So anterior chamber paracentesis, again, isn't on the list of things we try until after we've given intra-arterial thrombolytics. Now here's a slightly different image. This kind of looks like, I don't know, an ocean. Someone has an ocean flowing up on sand. It turns out, this is a picture of a 20-year-old male who was hit by a hockey puck in his left eye. He now has vision loss in the affected eye. Flashes of light presented in the affected eye also are seen just after the images. And he also notices that since the injury, he has numerous floaters in his vision. So he got hit in the eye, flashes of light, and floaters. And on fundoscopic exam, you see this. And they're pointing out this very sharply demarcated change in what the retina looks like. And you see numerous retinal folds and then posterior vitreous detachment as well. 
What is the most likely diagnosis here? Well, what is the next best step in management as well? Well, you know and I know that retinal detachment is an emergency condition. When the retina sloughs away from its underlying layer of support tissue, most commonly due to trauma. It can lead to vision loss, blindness long-term if not treated urgently, and post-traumatic vision loss, they will always tell you there's flashes of light and floaters, which is always suggestive of retinal detachment. If you don't know what a floater is, what I want all of you to do is stop, look at a white wall, and just glance your vision left and right. And some of you might see a little dark thing that floats across your vision. I've got one right there. One floater, two floaters, it's actually very normal for people to have them. But having numerous, numerous, numerous floaters suddenly with flashes of light, that's always retinal detachment. For you in the internal medicine world, in the American Board of Internal Medicine, retinal detachment, the only thing you do is an ophthalmologic consult because ophthalmology is the only people who can fix it because this is considered an emergency. This is the only time the ophthalmologist will say, I will actually come to the emergency room. Also remember, posterior vitreous detachment allows fluid to seep under the retina. And essentially what's happening, it's like a bubble under wallpaper. The bubble from water dripping from upstairs gets bigger and bigger and peels away at the retina, just like wallpaper would with that bubble. So you've got to get under control pretty quickly. And so one of the things we tell the patient to do is until the ophthalmologist arrives, put your head back, lean back, just lean back. Lean back, right? You tell them to lean back because then the fluid won't go down with gravity. Because if you think about it, the retina is like this, just like I'm standing. And the fluid is built up above and is just hanging with gravity. And gravity is 9.8 meters per second per second. So it's pulling down on that bubble, searing away at the retina. That bubble has mass effect. So because of that, you tell them to lean back so the bubble doesn't cause any pain. Basic things. Simple things can save this person's vision. Then the best therapy from the ophthalmologist will be laser photocoagulation in which they'll just basically bing, 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 bing. They will tack the actual retina back to the eye to prevent the spread of detachment and to hold it up against it. A 75 year old male in our next case presents with gradual visual loss of the last several years. He's been using reading glasses, magnifying glasses and extra lights while reading menus at restaurants. He says he has to let his wife drive the car as he has difficulty with seeing the road signs. Recently, his wife says he thinks the edges of doors are curved and he says he cannot even see your face. What is the most likely diagnosis, the test, and the therapy for this problem? For those of you who are wondering what is going on with edges of doors being curved, is he psychotic, he can't see faces, oh my God, he must be in the upside down from Stranger Things, no! The most likely diagnosis is macular degeneration, and it's a gradual loss of vision and appears in two forms, wet and dry. In the dry form, cellular debris called drusen accumulates between the retina and the choroid. In the wet form, new blood vessels grow up from the choroid behind the retina. Again, macular degeneration is the most common cause of blindness in the United States. It is not diabetes. It is nothing else. It is macular degeneration. Fluorescein angiography is used in the diagnosis and localization of abnormal vascular processes as the next best step in management. And then bevacizumab, which is a VEGF inhibitor that treats the underlying cause for patients with specifically wet macular degeneration. Our next case, case number seven. You see this image here. Ugh, does not look good. This is a 67-year-old male with diabetes who presents for a yearly ophthalmologic examination. He has a history of diabetic nephropathy, gastroparesis, and peripheral vascular disease. And when you look in your eye, in his eye rather, you see this. And he tells you, yeah, yeah, I've gone to ophthalmologists before. They do something. I don't know why. Fundoscopic exam reveals macular edema, vitreous hemorrhages consistent with flame and neovascularization, and previous treatment markings. What is the most likely diagnosis of the therapy here? Well, this is something you will take care of in internal medicine. This is diabetic retinopathy, and it's the result of microvascular retinal changes because of high blood sugar. What you saw there was somebody who had already had an eye exam with multiple therapeutic modalities. Here's what's going on. As the disease progresses, severe non-proliferative diabetic retinopathy leads to blood vessel proliferation. The best therapy is then pan-retinal photocoagulation as the best next step in the management. 
And that eye exam is somebody who has ongoing diabetes, because it's not getting better, who's had photocoagulation in the past. And the goal is to create about 1,600 to 2,000 burns with a rate laser, just bing, 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 in the retina. And what that does, it actually reduces the retina's oxygen demand, which decreases the chances of ischemia. Pretty basic idea, but it works. Case number eight. Oof, oof. Does not look good there. Is this trauma? Let's find out. A 19-year-old male presents with swelling and erythema around his left eye. The patient recently had bacterial rhinocytositis, and he was treated with amoxicillin clavulinate, but the patient did not fill the prescription. Examination shows proptosis, diplopia, redness, and swelling of the eyelid, and a white discharge with purulence of the eye. They're asking you, what's the diagnosis here? Well, this combination of fever, purulent discharge, erythema with swelling upon moving of the eye, are findings consistent with orbital cellulitis. Now, just on visual exam and history, it's difficult to distinguish between orbital cellulitis and preceptal and postceptal cellulitis, because once you look at it, you can't actually tell if the inflammation is infiltrating into the extraocular muscles and fatty tissues within the orbit. You can't tell on visual inspection. So the next best step in management to this patient is going to be you gotta get a CAT scan of the orbit, which will confirm if the infection is past the septum and has invaded the musculature. After the infection destroys the eye, the next target is the brain. The eye is part of the central nervous system. So the CAT scan is imperative. Urgent identification and initiation of antibiotics also reduce morbidity and mortality. Case number nine is a 34-year-old GI fellow who has a three-month history of jaw pain and clicking below his right ear. He notes that it gets worse with chewing and it disturbs his sleep. A nurse told him he has bruxism when he fell asleep on call. I'm sure the nurse found out that while he was on call. The patient denies any headaches or recent tooth issues. Physical exam shows crepitus at the temporal mandibular jaw, that TMJ. What is the next best step in management? Is it NSAIDs? Give him some paroxetine because he's clearly depressed. Jaw MRI. Apply some heat and physical therapy. Or let's get some x-rays and see what happens. Remember, ladies and gentlemen, when you're answering the question, and this has been the same since step one, two, and three, next best step in management or next step in management, you have to ask yourself, well, what am I going to do here that's going to change the outcome of this patient? Doing tests for the sake of doing them is to no end. But doing tests that change management is appropriate. And for someone who has this disorder, which is TMJ, jaw heat, so warm compresses to the actual jaw, and jaw physical therapy are the best step in management. And so when you have temporomandibular joint disorder, you're going to have this pain with chewing and moving that joint. The management is basically just therapeutic exercises, jaw relaxation, so shut the hell up. <laughs> That's what you can tell your patient, and they get better over time. If the pain is excruciating, they can use NSAIDs as long as they don't have any specific contraindication. Case 10, well, they're going to ask you very simply, which of the following is the best intervention to reduce fall risk in elderly patients with chronic dizziness? The answer, is it meclizine, beta blockers, antidepressants? Hire a home health aide, and you all know from ABIM and from your residencies, they do tons, those home health aides. Or is it physical rehab? The answer? physical rehabilitation. So any kind of graded exercise regimen in which they're getting balanced training is incredibly helpful. It has been shown to help stabilize the elderly in their walking. In case 11, case 11 they say to you, what is the next best step in management to stop anterior nosebleeds? Our friend here has a nosebleed. How are you going to stop it? Well, you're going to tell the patient consistent pressure for at least 15 minutes over the bridge of the nose will help stop the anterior nosebleed. Now, if that pressure didn't help for refractory epistaxis, nasal arterial embolization is the next step in management. And in this actual arteriogram, what you can see here are actually two pseudoaneurysms that have developed, and those will be embolized to stop the bleeding. Case 13 is a 38-year-old bald endocrinologist who presents with a headache, purulent nasal discharge, and facial pain over his right maxilla for four days. He knows that the pain is worse when he leans forward. Nasal exam shows inflamed turbinates with a small amount of purulent discharge. And this 38-year-old bald endocrinologist on otoscopic exam actually is normal. 
What is the next best management of this 38-year-old bald endocrinologist? Well, most cases of viral or bacterial sinusitis, regardless of age, hair amount, or career, resolve spontaneously within 10 days of actual observation and treatment of the associated symptoms with simply just analgesics and decongestions. That's all they need. Don't go crazy with CAT scans. Don't go crazy with antibiotics. Simple, supportive care, rest, and a lot of orange juice, and maybe some of mom's soup will help. In case 14, another bald 38-year-old endocrinologist presents with a headache, sore throat, and symptoms of an upper respiratory infection. He notes he has ear pain, but on physical exam, his auditory canals are normal, as are the tympanic membranes. What is the best next step in the management of this 38-year-old bald endocrinologist with a headache, sore throat, and an upper respiratory infection, who also has some ear pain? Well, Observation is the most appropriate treatment. You don't give antibiotics for adults with otitis media. Only munchkins get that. And this is the American Board of Internal Medicine, not the American Academy of Pediatrics. On case 15, they're gonna ask you which of the following causes drug-induced hearing loss that is either reversible or irreversible. In other words, we're gonna give you all the meds you need to know. So, aminoglycosides, irreversible hearing loss. Chemotherapeutics, irreversible. Aspirin, partially reversible. NSAID abuse, partially reversible. Anti-malarials, ooh, going to India? Oh, reversible, thank goodness. Woo! Loop diuretics, oh man, diuretics, Lasix, oh, it's irreversible, damn. So you might be dry, and you'll be peeing a lot, but you can't hear yourself peeing. And remember, there are two kinds of hearing losses that you need to know. There's conductive hearing loss and sensory neural. So let's go through the three conductive hearing losses you need to know, why they happen, and the treatments. So for ceremon impaction, basically ceremon has blocked the canal or becomes impacted from using a Q-tip. Look, if you've got an itch in your ear and you're near a Q-tip, it's almost as good as sex. But the fact of the matter is, you shouldn't be using them. And you should also tell your patients not to be because those Q-tip fibers over time aggregate and impact the ear. Gentle irrigation or ear curette by someone who knows how to do it is the appropriate management here. Autosclerosis is basically bony overgrowth of the stapes foot plate with fixation. And then a stapedectomy and a hearing aid is what's appropriate in terms of treatment. A tympanic membrane perforation. Tympanic membrane perforation. This is usually from trauma barotrauma or explosions. There are attacks all over the world and for every people that die, there are more who lose their hearing. For this, you basically have to keep the ear dry and the heels over time without intervention. This is conductive hearing loss. Now, sensory neural hearing loss, the first type you need to know is something known as presbycusis. This is age-related hearing loss and it's usually high frequency sounds. For those patients, you give them hearing aids. For those who have noise-induced hearing loss, this happens when you and I go to a Drake concert. Basically, you have a history of a loud noise, you're at a concert, and what ends up happening is, you know, prevention is the mainstay. Wear some earmuffs. But if it's Drake, sometimes you just gotta beat to the dr rhythm, you know what I'm saying? So ladies and gentlemen, that's all of ENT, an ophthalmology that you need to know. I'll see you in the next section.